Welcome back to Master Glass. I'm your host, Livio, and today I'm going to be tasting three different gins from the beautiful country of Italia. Uh, now, what do the Italians know about gin? Turns out they know a lot. Let's get into it. As I mentioned here in the intro, the history of gin in Italy is quite fascinating, quite rich, um, and also rich of amnesia and forgetting that we even made gin in Italy. Fascinating story. As a matter of fact, there's so much info here that I'm going to have to read it off a little bit for uh, to you as I kind of explain. I'm excited to let you know that we have launched a spirits course on MasterYourGlass.com. While you're there, you can also find this t-shirt in the shop. You can find the Cocktail Clarity cocktail book. You can also find some free resources such as flashcards. Just go to masterglass.com and the course is already heavily discounted. But if you enter the code MYG Spirits, it'll get discounted even more. Let's get back to the video. Uh, this video would never have happened if it weren't for my dear friend Fulvio Piccinino who wrote the book on Italian gin in Italy. And there's some really incredible research that he has done and I'm going to bring it to you and so we can talk about it and then I can taste these beautiful gins. Uh, a, a writer in a medical student of botany in 1544 by the name of Pietro Mattioli claimed that the juniper from Siena uh, was the best to use for medicinal beverages. Now, as you know, gin before being what we drank, it was actually, uh, it actually came from a medicinal beverage because juniper helps cure kidney disorders and all other sort of stomach ailments. So already in 1544, the juniper or Italy had the knowledge that juniper was good for your tummy. Uh, next, if I, if I read here in 1679, in a book by Francesco Sirena it, called L'Arte dello Speziale, uh, he explains how the addition of a new expensive ingredient called sugar is turning hard to drink medicines into potable beverages. So we know that before it was a medicine, now we know that by adding a little sugar to it, it makes the aspirin go down, makes the medicine go down, just like Mary Poppins said. So this is a really good connection on the historical uh, uh, connection. Now, in this book, there were over 1,200 different recipes of uh, made with uh, made with herbs and spices, but one of the interesting one was one called Alqua Balsamica del Napolitano, and this recipe not only in included uh, ingredients that easily would appear in a modern gin, but it also had the same production process of gin. So okay, maybe it wasn't called gin. But it was a gin. Uh, another book that Pulcinino looked into was called the Il Confetturiere Piemontese uh, by a gentleman by Ray Beltramo. And this came uh, was printed in Turin in 1790. And in this book here, there's actually a recipe. It says, nine ounces of juniper are soaked and placed to macerate for two days in four pints of wine brandy and then distilled over lower heat, thus obtaining a product transparent in water. If you're not familiar, that is exactly how gin was made. And this was from the 1790s. Now, interestingly, what happened in Italy is right at about the 19th century, when liqueurs became more and more popular, Italy realized that it was exporting a lot more of liqueurs. It was, it liked making more liqueurs and that perhaps gin was not worth using their stills for. And so they stopped making stills and they started making more liqueurs. Um, and then in 1906, the president of the Italian Federation of Wines, we have this documented, he sends a letter to all the producers and basically says, hey, listen, you need to start making gin. We need to make this new product called gin uh, because in America, people are drinking our liqueurs and our vermouths and our 
bitters, and of course, they're mixing it with gin because those liqueurs are a match made in heaven. So why don't you start making gin? So where's the amnesia? How could the president of the Italian Federation of Wine in 1906 not know that in the 1700s, we were already making something like this? Well, Pulcinino in his book, he claims something really interesting, which is the history of liqueurs was documented by the monks and by the doctors, right? Because liqueurs were medicine. Now, the monks had the ability to melt paper and rewrite paper. And so thus they were not only able to document history, but they were also able to, in many ways, cancel their history in their archives if they felt like the, the papers that they were holding on to were not relevant. On the flip, but they kept archives. On the flip side of that, when a doctor who was studying medicine, putting together juniper-paste beverages of sorts, um, when that doctor passed away, basically the studio was thrown away. So with that went all that history, hence why possibly there was the amnesia of us not even knowing that we are a country rich in gin production. Now, Italian gins are very cool. Uh, typically, what uh, the way they are produced is that the distillery is separate to the founder, and a lot of the distillation is done either through vacuum distillation or cold distillation, which is a slow extraction of those flavors, thus making Italian gins a little bit more easy uh, to drink, a little bit more uh, just pleasant and easy going. Additionally, Italians have access in every region to their own specific herbs and spices, ingredients that they are putting inside of their gins, thus creating basically new flavors that we've never really come across. The first gin I am tasting here is called Rossi D'Angera. This distillery is about 170 years old. It's in Lake Maggiore, which is on the south side of the Alps. And this company here actually started making their gin, their first gin, uh, in 1930. Uh, it's 45% alcohol by volume. And for what I know about it is it puts emphasis on the bergamot orange uh, as one of the ingredients, botanical, that you would find inside this gin. Color is clear, no need to comment on that. Let's look at the aroma. Aroma is definitely very citrusy. With a mild juniper, but also some nice little mint aroma to it. I just did an episode on Pernod and Ricard, so I can catch star anise pretty good right now and I'm catching it right in there. So we've got this anise, we've got this citrus, we've got this bergamot orange, a little bit of juniper, really, really nice on the aroma. Mm. Flavor is also really nice. On the flavor, I'm getting a lot of rootiness now. So there's a little, little nice rooty component to it. The uh, star anise or the anise flavor has really gone down a bit, but the bergamot orange is popping very nicely. This is a real delicate gin, and what I would use this for would just to be like a, just for a very delicate style gin and tonic. Something in the afternoon, you know, of course, we're drinking an Italian gin here. So no matter where you are in the world drinking it, just pretend like you're at a beautiful cafe in Italy under a nice, beautiful tree that's 500 years old, that's shading you from the sun. And as you're just people watching and there's these vintage Vespa scooters and cars, you're just sipping on a nice, delicate gin and tonic with Rossi D'Angelo. Um, romanticism aside, a very easy uh, gin, uh, easygoing gin, but highly aromatic. 
Portofino gin here not only carries the name of Portofino, the beautiful uh, maritime area uh, in Liguria, which is kind of the groin of the Italian leg, uh, it also contains some ingredients from it. These ingredients are sunbathed in the beautiful hills, and they also uh, take advantage of the nice little sea uh, briny uh, winds to it. Uh, Portofino is made in Piedmont, but it's inspired by um, the Portofino area. And what it is, is it's a gin with 21 different botanicals in it. Uh, some of them are your usual suspects, such as the juniper, uh, the lemon, uh, the uh, the marjoram, uh, and, and all of those. But they also add a few ingredients from actually the Portofino Hills. So I'm excited to try this one. By the way, what an incredible package, right? When you're drinking this, you're literally living the lifestyle of that beautiful maritime coastal area of Italy. This one here comes across a little bit more pungent on the nose with a big, rich, uh, lemony, citrusy aroma to it. The juniper is there, but it's kind of on the bottom. And the rootiness that I was getting from the Rossi d'Angera is way to the bottom. So this, uh, what I'm getting here is a lot more of a citrus forward aroma to it. Mm. Mm. Yeah, this gin is definitely more rich. On the palate, it's more floral. I'm getting rose petals a lot of rose petals. I'm also getting, um, again, a little bit of that anise, but this time, uh, let's scratch that, actually more of a rosemary. So I'm getting a rose petal and rosemary juniper citrus influenced gin. Still very delicate though. It's funny how it can come out with a burst of flavors, but, there's, but it stays very calm, cool, and collected. A very interesting gin here. This is coming in at 43% alcohol by volume, which is 86 proof. Um, I don't, uh, I don't, um, I wouldn't do the gin and tonic with this one here. I would perhaps do a very cool cocktail. I'll put the description below, uh, which is called the Bicicleta, also known as the Aragosta in uh, Sardinia. But it is basically one ounce of gin, two ounces of Campari, three ounces of local dry white wine over ice, add an orange, because in this case here, uh, that nice little uh, rosemary and rose petal flavor, I feel are really gonna sit on top of that Campari and give me some yummy and delicious flavors. Next, what I have here is Poli Marconi 42. A 42 comes from the fact that it is 42 percent alcohol by volume. Now, if you don't know Poli, then you probably don't know Grappa because Poli is a producer of incredible world-class Grappas. And I'm pretty interested in trying the gin as well. Uh, now, uh, Mar uh, Poli Marconi 42 is actually distilled with a still called Chrysopea. And this is a vacuum still, which uses a Bagne Marie uh, heating process. Bagne Marie basically means that you're heating a water source that is then heating the still, which is just a little bit more delicate, or I should say a lot more delicate. Um, the botanicals that are chosen in this gin are meant to complement the juniper, so to play kind of in a way that the juniper gets to play its role without too much of it being covered. But let's see what this is all about. Oh, wow. Wow, very, what an incredible aroma. Very powerful, but nice. I'm getting like some balmy uh, aroma, a lot of perfume, a lot of floral, just a very, very nice, very pleasant, but rich um, aroma to it. Oh gosh, a little touch of rootiness, but yeah, just balmy, very, very balmy in its, in its uh, aroma and a lot of perfume here, a lot of floral perfume. Wow, wow. Oh, wow, incredible. So the taste um, still recalls this lemon balmy 
flavor to it, but cranked up a notch and it's very nice. So I have this lemon balm that's probably here. The juniper flavor is a tad below it, but I'm assuming it's actually incorporated in this lemon balm aroma that I'm having. A nice little uh, rootiness, uh, but this is a rich gin with elegant flavors, meaning it's bold. It's flavorful, but it's not in your face. It's just flavorful, abundant with these floral, lemon balm, juniper, tad of rootiness to it. Um, in this case here, just give me booze. I'm thinking that because I want some brine right now, that I would love to do a Gibson martini. So give me those onions and give me that crunch to it and just add some brine to this gin. So let's go with a Gibson for this uh, uh, gin right here, which I found to be super incredible. Now I will leave just some suggested recipes in the description below. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video about Italian gins, Italian amnesia, and all awesome things that come from Italy. Uh, so if you did, please give it a like and come back to Master Glass for expert instruction for everyday consumption.